into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise, there's no one like you. None like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. Into the darkness you shine. Out of the ashes we rise. There's no one like you, none like you. Our God is greater, our God is stronger. God, you are higher than any other. Our God is healer, awesome in power. Our God, our God. stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against and if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against and if our God is for us then who could ever stop us and if our God is with us then what could stand against what could stand against stand against what could stand against Amen be seated hey, but can you if y'all would come on up come on up hey isn't it good to be in God's house Particularly blessed day for me because you want to say a few words, it'd be easier. Because we have with us uh, Katie Sue and Wendell McWaters, or Mac H2O as we refer to them. And we go back to childhood. And uh, it, is a, it is a blessed thing to see not only our generation get to be old enough to have children and grandchildren, but it is a blessing to be able to see that these children have done well. And, and these are two that have done well. Now, I've not known Nicole quite as long as I've known Josh, but I've known Josh ever since he came into this world. And, and I just want you to know he was the goofiest kid you have ever seen. Him and his brother Jonah, we would put them up to stuff and they would just go do it. You know, don't you just love little boys like that? Just, I bet you won't jump off the top of the church. There they go. So this was, this was him. And, and he's, really, he's really shy. 
and which is what's making this even more enjoyable for me because I'm just talking and keeping it up here longer. Uh, but it is such a, a blessing to be able to dedicate these little children. You know, dedication is not the same as baptism. Uh, Colt will have to come into his own personal relationship with Jesus. But it is a time of introduction for us, and it's also a time of commitment for us. And so, if you would, can, will you come to me? Okay, you get the microphone. You get it. Oh, we'll go there. We'll, there. <laughs> okay, we got it. Okay. <laughs> this is Tim's microphone. It's good. It's good. This is Colt. And I just wanted to introduce him to you because, Colt, you don't know it right now because you're busy eating the microphone. Out there sits all the people that will be praying for you as you grow and all the people that will, that will be here with you when you have problems and when you celebrate victories in your life. And, and not only that, but some of them will be your Sunday school teachers and, and they will teach you the stories of the Bible and they will help you as you come into your relationship with Christ. And We're not doing damage here, are we? Okay. And, and some of them will be your deacons and... But either way, this is your church family. I know. Hello. So as part of what we do when we dedicate our children is, is it's a commitment for us, for each and every individual, for every man that you walk in a way that this young fella can model his life after, okay? And for all of you others, this is, this is we're all in it together time. But it's also a time when we ask for a commitment on the part of our family. Do you commit as the head of your household that you will lead your family in a godly way that will lead them straight to the throne to the very feet of Jesus as they come into a saving knowledge? You, you promise to do that, the head of the home, and you promise as his helper in this process as mom to do that because that's so huge. Just a moment, we're going to pray, but I also want to, I also want to say something else. This is a day that I'm particularly proud for because this young family is formally moving their membership to be part of our church family. Isn't that great? Hey, Amen. Give them a hand. There you go. You can see them now. All right. Let's pray together, okay? All right. Father God, we just ask for your, ask for your grace in this moment, Lord. Father, you have blessed this church, this family, in so many ways. You've blessed them with beautiful children. We pray over them. We dedicate them now. We dedicate ourselves to being faithful to your word, to teach the truth. And we also pray over this family as they dedicate themselves to live in such a way that there is only one possibility, and that is for these dear precious children to come to a saving relationship, a growing and maturing relationship in Christ. We just pray now that you give us strength and give us courage. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. All right. It's okay. It's fine. You know, sometimes it sounds better when you do stick it in your mouth like that. <laughs> Y'all, let's stand together. We're going to receive our offering this morning, and we're going to sing. But the blood of Jesus for my cleansing this my plea nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus you turn around and greet each other this morning Take somebody's hand and get back up here. You don't want to. 
you rather them come to you and hug you instead of you go hug your girl? But the blood of Jesus, God of good that I have done, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my hope. And Nothing but the blood of Jesus. This is all my righteousness. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. So precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. No other fault I know. Nothing but the blood of Jesus. There is a fountain who is a king, victorious warrior and lord of everything. My rock, my shelter, my very home, blessed redeemer who reigns upon the throne. fountain who is a king victorious warrior and lord of everything my rock my shelter my very own blessed redeemer who reigns upon the throne service. That's okay. Go ahead, Chris. Heart. You lead us by 
my still waters into mercy. And nothing can keep us apart. So remember your people. Remember your children. Remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough for me. Great is your love and justice, God. You use the weak to lead the strong. You lead us in the song of your salvation. And all your people sing along. children, remember your promise, O oh God. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me. Your grace is enough. Your grace is enough, your grace is enough for me.
You see, Jesus is perfect because he's God. We can't be perfect because we aren't God, but we can become more and more like Jesus every day. It's a process and it has a special name. Sunday school lady? It's a really great word. Sanctification. Say it with me. Sanctification. Sanctification. I love it. What is it? Just as the word justification means to justify, the word sanctification means to sanctify. But I don't know what sanctify means. I wasn't finished. Sanctify means to make holy or to free from sin. Remember when we said God wants to save us from the stain of sin? That's justification. We get a new label. In God's eyes, we become righteous. But we also said God wants to save us from the power of sin. So sin no longer has control over us, no longer whispers in our ears. We become more like Jesus. That's sanctification. Before Michael picked that, can y'all hear me? Michael picked that out and um, those little cartoon characters, you'd be surprised who some of those he said you look like. I've made no, uh, you know, no apologies about it. I, my goal in life is to be a cowboy on a kickball team. And so, guess who was the cowboy there? I don't know. Hey, isn't it good to be in God's house this morning? Hey, look at somebody and tell them you love them this morning. Now just, now just look at somebody else and say, we've got the prettiest babies in the whole world in this church. <laughs> Jonathan, you weren't supposed to tell George that. I mean, he's not one of those pretty babies. I asked Colt if he had anything else he wanted to say. We might bring him back up here in just a few minutes. He was doing so good a while ago. You know, the last time I lost my glasses, this time I just lost the microphone. I feel pretty fortunate today. I mean, you know what I'm saying? Hey, isn't it great to have baby dedication? Isn't it? I love it. I love it. And, and what I like more than anything else is seeing how these little kids do as they grow up and seeing how they, how they finish well. It's just a cool thing. And I was thinking, you know, I can't help but get a little bit emotional about, about especially with, with Josh, because... Josh was that quiet kid. You know, he's, really, he's talkative now. I mean, you know, he's talkative now. And I thought, well, you know, the boy's never going to have a girlfriend because he's never going to ask anybody out. But I would say that the boy outpunted his coverage in Nicole, wouldn't you? I mean, really. You know, you need to put an extra 10 spot in the offering plate just to thank God. I mean, you know, so it's good to see you this morning. We are going through the blessings of the believer. And, and we have, we've talked about a great many things this morning. Uh, we're going to be talking about sanctification, obviously. But, but back in the day, when we had problems, we had people we could go to to help us figure things out. Now, when I say back in the day, you, you know what that means, right? That, that means... If you're old, you're going, to remember, you're going to know who I'm talking about here, okay? So back in the day is just that kind of code word for old people understand and young people are going to go, what's he talking about? Okay, so we're going to help you out. But one of the people back in the day that would answer questions, you know, hard questions, everybody struggles, right? From time to time. If you struggle from time to time, just say amen. I mean, so, you know, we struggle from time to time and... Nobody's perfect, and, and we do have some things that pop up in life. And I mean, Jason, wouldn't you say that you have struggled some? I mean, you know, can, can I just share something with you? You ain't struggled none like you're going to struggle in a couple more years, okay? All you young guys that have daughters, bless your heart. Bless your heart. One of the people that back in the day would answer questions when people would pose these questions was a person by the name of Dear Abby. Y'all remember, how many of you remember Dear Abby? How many of you don't know what I'm talking about? 
That's because you weren't back in that day. She was a columnist, and you could write in with your problems, and she would give you advice. We didn't have Facebook back then, so you couldn't put it on Facebook and let people weigh in on your issue. Actually, there's a lot of good things that didn't, you know, that you couldn't do back then that people do now. But, but you could write in and she would answer your question. I just want to share a few of these. Dear Abby, our son married a girl when he was in the service. They were married in February, and she had an eight and a half pound baby girl in August. She said the baby was premature. Can an eight and a half pound baby be this premature? <laughs> wanting to know. Dear, wanting to know. The baby was on time. The wedding was late. Okay, forget it. Somebody said amen, right? Amen. amen. Dear Abby, is it possible for a man to be in love with two women at the same time? Jake. Dear Jake, yes, and also it is hazardous. Okay? And that's a fact. Dear Abby, I've been going with this girl for a year. How can I get her to say yes, Jonathan? Dear Jonathan. <laughs> Dear Jonathan, what's the question? I mean, you know, for all you visiting, just don't, you know, you don't, but... But Jonathan, it was, it was like watching a 2,700 episode television show. Will Jonathan ever ask Ashley to marry him? <laughs> that, but she did. He did. And she did say yes, and we're thankful for that. We're thankful for that. Ashley just took a new teaching position, and she's in North Alabama. And I'm telling you, my heart's already broken because it is just going to be hard, hard, hard uh, not, to, not to look forward to seeing Ashley every Sunday. I hope she gets to come most Sundays. And uh, to celebrate her taking this new job, Jonathan got him a new hairdo, and I, I kind of like that. It's kind of <laughs> spiky. All right, back to, back to Dear Abby. Back to Dear Abby. I mean, this is good stuff. Dear Abby, what's the difference between a wife and a mistress, Bess? Dear Bess, <laughs> not in day. <laughs> Back in the day, people understood that kind of language. <laughs> Dear Abby, I have always wanted to have a family history, my family history traced, but I can't afford to spend a lot of money to do it. Have you any suggestions? Dear MJB, yes, run for public office. Somebody will run every one of your folks down. <laughs> Getting to the end. Dear Abby, what inspires you most to write? Ted. Dear Ted, the Bureau of Internal Revenue. That'll do it. <laughs> I love this one. Dear Abby, are birth control pills deductible? Birdie. Dear Birdie, <laughs> only if they don't work. Hey, then they become a deduction. You got that, didn't you? Yeah, you will get that one. Dear Abby, I know boys will be boys, but my boy is 73, and he's still chasing women. Any suggestions, Annie? Dear Annie. Don't worry, my dog's been chasing cars for years, but if he ever caught one, he wouldn't know what to do with it. All right. And I love this guy, this guy. I like this guy because he's like me. I know that I am the problem with my life. I am all too human. I am a slave to my own desires. I don't really understand myself. I want to do right, but I don't. Instead, I do what I hate. I know that nothing good lives in me. 
I want to do right, but I can't. I want to do good, but I don't. There seems to be this war going on in me constantly. What a miserable person I am. What is wrong with me? Who can free me from this kind of life? Now, now hold up. I'm sure that some of you have already figured out that wasn't a letter to dear Abby. That was a letter from dear Paul. If you would join me just for a second in Romans chapter 7. I'm not going to read the whole thing, but he's speaking of himself. And that's where we're going today. I know... I know some of you already know a lot about sanctification because you've lived a long time and and you have seen God work through this process in your life. But Paul, who is the guy that will take the New Testament, if you will, the gospel of grace to the Gentile world. If you've been in our Bible study on Wednesday night in the book of Acts, you know that that even after Jesus died and was resurrected, there was a period of time there where, hey guys, it took time to figure out this thing called Christianity, this thing called God's family. It wasn't a simple process of, boy, everybody got it all at one time. And and, and this whole process of being Christ-like. I mean, have you ever thought about what it would be like to be a dedicated follower of Jesus without the Word of God at your disposal? Now, I just want to kind of put a commercial in in here before I go any further. What we neglect, they would have dearly loved to have. What we put on our coffee tables and in our cars and where we leave in our pews or whatever, at our office at work, and we don't hardly open them, they would dearly love to have. Paul says here in in, in Romans that that he, he is struggling, even though... Paul is that guy. Paul is that guy, you know. We don't have to turn to dear Abby for answers because we have the Word of God, amen? And so let's go to that chapter, chapter 7 in the book of Romans. I'm going to start in verse 14. And this is what he said, I paraphrased it. For we know that the law is spiritual, but I am of the flesh, sold under sin. For I do not understand my own actions. For I do not do what I want, but I do the very thing I hate. Now if I do what I do not want, I agree with the law that it is good. So now it is no longer I who do it, but the sin that dwells within me. For I know that nothing good dwells in me that that is my flesh. For I have the desire to do what is right, but not the ability to carry it out. For I do not do the good that I want, but the evil that I do not want, which I keep on doing. Now if I do what I do not want, it is no longer I, but the sin that dwells within me. So I find it to be a law that when I want to do right, evil lies close at hand. For I delight in the law of God, in the inner being, but I see my members another war, a law waging against Uh, the law of my mind and making me captive to the law of sin that dwells in my members. Verse 24, please underline it in your Bible. Wretched man that I am, who will deliver me from this body of death? The answer is found in verse 25. Thanks be to God that through Jesus Christ our Lord. Isn't that amazing? Who can deliver us from this miserable life that we sometimes find ourselves in? It's Jesus. Everybody just say that with me. It is Jesus. Y'all say it like you mean it this time. It's who? It's Jesus. That's who delivers us. Father God, thank you so much for this day. Oh, just the privilege to come and worship and be together as a family. To come in and see the beautiful children and know what great hope we have. Because we have our Savior, we have our Lord, but we also have great hope in these young people. That they will bring about a good work also because you're in their lives working through them. So Lord, we just pray over these families, especially these young families. So Lord, I pray now for those of us that struggle, that the wonderful words of this dear godly man that you called will be an inspiration to us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. How many of you struggle sometimes? I mean, I, I do. I've always walked right on the edge of of obedience and rebellion. How about you? I mean, I I have an old nature. 
and I have a new nature, my old nature can be very temperamental. It can also be, well, let me put it this way. My first instinct is not flight. My instinct is always what? Fight. If I can hit it with a stick rather than talk to it with a few words, I'd rather hit it with a stick. Amen? So I understand what Paul's saying. Now listen, if you're taking notes, this is what he's saying here. Paul is saying, I know that I've been justified. Now I don't have a question like Paul. As a believer, I have been declared righteous. But it is a work of God. You see, when we came to know Jesus as Savior, we were justified. And God put the righteousness of Jesus on our life. And so He doesn't see us any longer. He sees us through the righteous robe of Jesus. Isn't that hallelujah ground this morning? And so I don't have to go back and worry about how my Heavenly Father sees me. And Paul knows that too. I know I've been made right with God. And he knows that he's been made right with God. Paul also knew that he had been redeemed. We talked about that last week. Freed in the slave market. Bought with the price of the precious blood of Jesus. Now, we also know that that brings about this thing called being born again. How many of you have been born again? Anybody in here? Listen, I've been born again. I'm not just cleaned up. I've been born again. I've been baptized into the body of Christ by the Holy Spirit. Isn't that great? There's only one baptism that, that, that counts towards salvation. And that is the baptism of the Holy Spirit as we are brought into the body of Christ. I also know that I have been sealed by the Holy Spirit. This is important, guys, because as a Christian, I don't have to worry about my salvation or my place in the kingdom because the Holy Spirit has sealed me, and guess what? In the body of Christ and in the Father's hand, and there's nothing on this earth that can take that away. Amen? I mean, that, that ought to be great news for some of us who struggle. Paul knew these things. Pam, Paul knew that he had been justified. He knew that he had been redeemed. But still he was struggling. When I was a young person, back when Katie and Wendell and I were, well, we had color in our hair. You know what I'm saying? I'd go to church and every sermon that Rass Fuller preached was to me. I knew it. I didn't know how he knew me so well. But he seemed to. Because I was struggling with how to walk as a young Christian. I was struggling with how to become a, a young godly man like some of you guys are struggling as you're growing as young ladies and, and as young men. It, it, it's a struggle sometimes even though you know that you're saved. You've been justified and you've been redeemed. This morning we're going to talk about that and it's called sanctification. And it means, literally, to set something apart for a special purpose, for a special use. And so, it also means that we've been separated from one thing unto another. Now, I'm going to you know, kind of help you here. When you were born again, when you were brought into the body of Christ, when you were saved, we use those words, you, you were moved from the world into the body of Christ. It wasn't that you had to work your way into this position. You were put in this position by a holy, loving God. And so you went from here to here, and that's what the word sanctify literally means. When we hear the word saint, we tend to think about people with halos. How many of you, when you think about the word saint, you immediately think of someone other than yourself? Anybody in here? How many of you, when you hear the word saint, immediately think about me? Anybody in here? Get Colt back up here. Where's Colt? Saint doesn't mean that you're perfect. Saint just means that you have been separated from this unto this. You've literally been separated from the kingdom of darkness to the kingdom of light. For a purpose. Where justification meant that God's righteousness was put on, imputed on you. It covered you. Sanctification means that it is the power of God that is now working through you and in you. 
to all men. It is that righteousness that comes out as we grow in our faith. Now, you don't have to turn to all these, but if you want to write these down, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 3 tells us that sanctification is the will that God has for every believer. In other words, it is God's God kind of desire that George Robinson not only be sanctified as he has been put into the body of Christ, but that every day he grows in that maturity and that Christ likeness as he progressively works toward being like Christ. And, and I, know, I know that seems kind of hard to understand sometimes that we don't have to work for our salvation, but because of our salvation, there's a tremendous work in our life. And we continue to grow. So to sanctify a person is to make him holy as God sees it. He has been set apart for God. That, that's, a, that's a tremendous thing, you see. Just like when we bring these little babies up here and say, Okay, church, are you willing, are you going to give your word that you will do everything in your power to see these young people come to a saving knowledge personally with Jesus? That, that's a task that we do. Are you all with me? It's what we do. Everything we do should lead them to Jesus and never away from Jesus. It is a work that the parents do to paint such a picture in their life that it is as natural as breathing air that that young child comes to know Jesus as Savior. Listen, it ought to be easy for a young people in this church to come to know Jesus. Amen? I mean, they ought to hear it in their home. And they ought to see it in this church and they're taught it and they hear it from the pulpit in a way that they can understand it. And that's why we have so many young people coming to that relationship with Christ. It's important that we understand that it is God's will for us as believers to be holy. Now if you would join me in John chapter 17. This is going to be kind of like a Bible drill. Jesus knew this wasn't going to be easy. As Jesus neared the end of His earthly ministry, He began to pray for those that He loved. Now let me stop there just a minute while you're still getting to jump. How many of you believe it's important to pray for those people that you love? I mean, really, how many of you believe in the power of prayer? If you do, raise your hand. Get them up there. How many of you believe in it? How many of you believe that if you believe in the power of prayer, that we ought to pray especially for those that we love? Now, we ought to pray for all people. We ought to pray for our leaders, even when we just look at them as being kind of ridiculous. But folks, we need to be praying for those people that we love. And we see Jesus doing that in John chapter 17. Look at verse 6. This is Jesus as He's praying. I have manifested Your name, that's the name of the Father, to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, and I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them, and have not come, and they have come to know the truth that I came from you, and that I have believed that you sent me, and I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the and I am no longer in the world, but and I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And, and I am coming to you, Holy Father. Keep them in your name, which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. While I was with them, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I have guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction, that the scriptures might be fulfilled. And now I am coming to you, and these things I speak in the world, that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, please underline that, and the world has hated them because they are not of this world just as I am not of this world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of this world, just as I am not of the world. Now look at verse 17. Sanctify them in the truth. And your word is truth. 
You sent me into the world so that I have sent them into the world, and for their sake I consecrate myself, that they also may be sanctified in the truth. And I love verse 20. I do not ask for these only, but for those who will believe in me through their word. Isn't that great? We are... We have been prayed over by Jesus Himself as He prayed over those that He walked with, but He also, because He was Jesus and the Son of God, He also prayed over us that He knew would be one day struggling with these same issues. If you would take these notes down under John 17. They are not of this world as I'm not. Listen, my home is not here. I don't belong to this place anymore. How about you? My home is eternal. And when if I ever live to be in a nursing home and, or on a, on, a, on a bed where my mind is gone, I know some of you are thinking that day's already come. And you hear me talk about going home, please don't take me to 1209 County Road 3319, Troy, Alabama. That ain't what I'm talking about. When it comes time to me to go home, I want to go home and be with my Lord. I, I have no fear of that. How about you? I don't belong to this world. I am a new creature with a new name and a new place. Jesus said, they're not of this world as I am not. Sanctify them by the truth. Your word is truth. The truth is we are born again and our position is in Jesus. If you're saved this morning, your position, your place is in Jesus. And that will never change. Now the problem is, everybody just say the problem. Here's the problem. Our bodies are still on planet earth. Sanctification is progressive when it comes to how we grow as a Christian. And we ought to be maturing. It's good to live long enough to see some of you guys mature. You know? I mean, listen. We bought you books. We sent you to school. And what did you do? You ate the covers off of them. That's all some of you did, right? But thank God something, when I wanted to kill my children when they were growing up, which was about every day, my beautiful wife would remind me that, Rick, they will be productive humans one day if you just let them live. Just let them live. This is my grandson's third birthday today. Three. He's already had two spankings this morning, you know. we got to talk about that. Talk to, <laughs> talk to him. We're on the same plan. We're to grow up in the Lord. And that's why, especially, and I'm talking to young people right now, you've got to be careful about the decisions you make now. Because a lot of them you may regret down the road. Paul reminds us in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, just write this down, that what God starts, He's faithful to finish in us. So what He started in this work of separation, this work of sanctification, God's going to do His part. He's going to take you where He's already decided you are to be. Now, there's a, because it is progressive, there's this part that we have to be involved in. That, that's really the heart of where I want us to, to look at for just real quickly this morning first, and there's only three of these. First one is this, it is impossible in the power of the flesh to live a life that's pleasing to God. How many of you that have gotten old enough to figure out that it, it is impossible to live the Christian life by your own strength? Anybody in here? How many of you, it was a great day when you realized that the Holy Spirit really will come along and give you power to live your life if you are relying on the Holy Spirit of God. You see, I don't, try, I don't spend near as much energy trying to be what I used to try to be now as something that I just relax and let God do in my life. Some of you are struggling because you're trying to be what you think you ought to be and you're trying to do it by your own strength and power. And the reality is you can only live that sanctified, maturing, growing life as the Holy Spirit empowers you. That's an amazing thing when you finally get that concept. That it's not all about what I can do. 
But because of that, you have a choice to make. And I know, how many of you hate to make choices? Anybody in here? I can make a choice. If my wife gives me a choice, I'll make a choice. And guess which choice it will be? Wrong. It'll be wrong every time. <laughs> There's this ritual I go through on Saturday night. Hey, baby. I'm fixing. See, I get, I get a lot more country when I'm at the house on Saturday night. I'm fixing to do everything. I'm fixing to go in there and pick out something for tomorrow. What you think? Okay. I'll hang them on the baker's rack. And she will come around and go, you wore that last week. <laughs> or Rick, those pants are blue. <laughs> and you know what happens, right? She takes them back in there and she gets me what she, why didn't she just do that to start with? Because <laughs> given a choice, I'm going to make the wrong one 100% of the time when it comes to that. But in the Christian life, now listen, you're going to choose every day whether you're going to live in the power of your own flesh or you're going to choose to live in the power of the Holy Spirit. And this is where the Word of God comes in. If you're struggling, then you need to spend more time in the Word of God. Amen? I mean, don't avoid it. Number two. The flesh and the spirit have nothing in common. Now, I, I, I want to be careful how I say this because I don't want to offend all of you. I just want to, well, I don't really care if I offend you. Not really, I mean, but anyway. We've gotten to a place in our culture where we don't want the gospel to be offensive. We've gotten to a place in our culture where we want everything to be okay. You can live like you want. You can just do whatever you want. And as long as you shout and swing from the banisters, everything's going to be okay. Let me tell you, write it down. Put it in the margin of your Bible. The flesh and the spirit have nothing in common. And that goes in our churches today. The word of God is clear. Romans chapter 8 verse 13 says, For if you live according to the flesh, you will die. But if you live by the Spirit, you put the deeds of the flesh to death and you'll live. You'll decide every day whether you're going to live by the power of the flesh or by the power of the Holy Spirit. My prayer is that you live by the power of the Holy Spirit. Galatians chapter 5 verses 16 and 17, Paul says, But I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. There is a very distinct line between what is fleshly and what is spiritual and I don't care how popular it is today in our modern culture, church is supposed to be about the worship of a holy God by a determined group of people that want to be like Him and not be like the world. One of the little things I did back when I was having to be my own youth minister and pastor, y'all been in some of those churches, haven't you? Is I get my brownie mix out. And I get all my young people there. Dallas, you'd have loved it. Because I made a big to-do out of it. I have the finest milk, finest cocoa, finest sugar. But off to the side, I'd have a little bowl of this crusty white powder. And that was the dog poop I had picked up in the yard earlier that day. Makes you look at Fifth Sunday lunch a different way. <laughs> And I would go through the whole thing about I got the finest milk and I got the finest cocoa and I got the finest sugar and just a little bit of this won't hurt you. Would you want to eat my brownies? No. Well, why do you think God wants that? He's given us the finest of everything and yet we take the, the poop of this world and we want to offer it back. You'll never grow like that. You'll never mature and you'll never grow. And let me tell you something. I don't care how many people pack into churches that teach that kind of mess. The Word of God teaches clearly. 
that the flesh and the spirit have nothing in common. Are y'all still with me this morning? Last one. And this is where we will end this morning. There is no middle ground. There's no middle ground. Jesus said in Matthew verse 24, Jesus said you will not be able to serve two masters. And the reason most of us struggle in our Christian life is because we don't want to serve one master. We want to serve ourselves. Jesus said you'll either love one or you'll hate the other, but you can't do both. If you're struggling this morning in your walk with Christ, then there's a couple of things you need to make sure you're... Some of it may be that you're trying to mix the world into your life, and your life as a believer has no place for it. But the other big issue may be that you haven't decided who you're going to serve. Who's really important to you? Is that fair enough this morning? I don't know any other way to say it to make it any clearer. We have been sanctified. We've been set apart into the body of Christ. And it is our ongoing journey as we walk through this world to please Him. So is your life pleasing? Struggling? This would be a great day to resolve some of those issues. Father God, thank you so much. What an awesome and holy God you are. Lord, we pray today that you help us understand how important it is that we live our lives as a separate people. We're not of this world. My, my goodness, we're not even close to being of this world. We're something far better. So help us, Lord. Give us that determination. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand. Grace